Hello and welcome to the 28th ever episode of the Unsound Manager Podcast. My name is Shiji Kolawole and each week I take a look at football speakers' headlines, stories and events from both the past and the present, really taking a look at the game and understanding what's going on. Now, big Premier League midweek fixtures, which was nice. I was a bit unprepared. I didn't actually know that there was midweek games on, but it's always solid when you come home and there's games on. Arsenal playing Manchester United in the We're Past It derby. The Merseyside derby, Manchester City being dominant, the Ballon d'Or, there was a bunch of stuff that happened, so let's run through it. Alright, so we can only start in one place, let's start at Old Trafford. Arsenal versus Manchester United, do you remember when this used to be a really important game? <laughs> like, when this was like a title decider, or you could see Ferguson's like tactical brilliance versus Wenger's amazing style of play, but now it's like... Both of us are rubbish. I said to my friends, this was like watching two heavyweight boxers fight, like slug it out, but both of them are past it, so there's no pace. It's just big thumping blows, and you hope you're going to knock the other one out. Like, we were both awful. The game itself was good, but both teams weren't good. I think the absence of good defending made the game enjoyable. I wanna, let's just run through it real quick. So Arsenal were one up due to David De Gea's play acting. I don't know why he was lying on the floor. Um, I saw a lot of people getting on thread online. I feel like those people have never played football. When you're in a crowded box at a corner, everyone's feet is everywhere. Right? You're just going to have to get over it. That's what happened. De Gea was acting, and I think he must have thought he was an Arsenal player, so he might get a free kick. Um, but no, Smith Rowe, good finish on the left. Arsenal go 1-0 up, and I'm thinking, okay, okay. And then defensively, we fall asleep at the back. Fred decides to beat Ronaldinho. Pulls it back and then ball gets squared to Bruno. Good finish. Cool. So it's 1-1. But in that gap, in that gap when Arsenal went 1-0 up, there was a period where Manchester United were trying to press and it was the most obvious at throwing. There was a throw-in on Tomiyasu's side. He throws it into the... He throws it into the right winger who plays it into the defensive midfield player, back to Tomiyasu, into Ben White at centre back, back into the defensive midfield, and we swung it all the way out to the left. And through that period, Manchester United pressed so poorly. And the commentators, I think I was watching the game on like Premier Sports or something, the commentators were a bit Arsenal biased, but they were like, I don't understand how Manchester United can think that's effective pressing. Either you don't press at all, or you have to press like a unit. But that right there was awful. Arsenal were getting out so easy. And I'm on this guy. I am onto him. Thomas Partey, I am unsure about your skills. But if you're giving Thomas Partey that much time on the board, then you really aren't pressing. We were. Arsenal weren't good, and we had a double pivot of Partey and El Nene. Two to me, neither of them are accomplished passers, but in the first half, they were getting the chances that they wanted. They weren't always succeeding with the passes, but they were getting the opportunity because United were pressing so, so badly. In the end, the game changes, and and Ronaldo comes in and finish, just does whatever. It's, not, it's a good finish. It's a good finish. It's nothing crazy. Then Odegaard basically scores the same goal the other end. And then Odegaard is drunk. And I don't know why he thought, A, the guy doesn't tackle. So why are you tackling now? And B, why did you tackle like that? And why did you do that in the box? It's just a combination of what are you doing? Uh, the second half of the game felt like Arsenal decided, um, I'm not sure if we want to attack anymore. Which didn't make sense because every single time we attacked, we looked like we were going to score because United was so poor. They couldn't, they couldn't defend well in any way. They've been on such a poor run. They haven't they hadn't won at home in months. This was the opportunity for Arsenal to go there and make a statement. Jump into the top four and prove that, that slow start of the season wasn't the real team. But they bottled it. That was the chance and they bottled it. And what frustrates me more than anything is that we conceded goals like Ronaldo's first goal is because Nuno Tavares just loses his brain for a second. United, when we're scoring, it's because United are making systemic, team-wide problems. Like, Odegaard's goal should not happen if you have two competent defensive midfield players and two competent centre-backs. If one of those four people says a word to the other three, Odegaard doesn't score. They're all silent, and the DMs aren't even chasing back. And that's why Odegaard's at the top of the box with a free chance to finish. 
with us, it was mistakes, like the penalty given away, or Nuno Tavares' goal, or just Fred having a bit of brilliance at the moment, we can't really stop it. But with them, it's issue after issue after issue, but we couldn't take advantage. This was a club that's just sacked their manager, they've got a caretaker, they just nonsense their way to a point at Chelsea because they weren't good there. We could they look horrible at home. We could have batted them. We didn't take the chance. Classic Arsenal. I do think we can finish top five. I don't even know. I can't even remember where I said we finished at the beginning of the season. But if I had to bet now, having seen a couple games, I wouldn't. I'd be excited if we finished fifth. I would be surprised if we finished fifth. For us to do that, I would. I would assume West Ham had a monumental collapse, and Conte couldn't get Tottenham to where he wanted to get them. But that's a different thing. Um, for Arsenal, there's a few points I want to take a look at. Um, Nuno Tavares versus Tierney at left back. I'm unsure what Arteta's thinking here. Um, Nuno Tavares is the superior athlete. And he is effective going forward. Like He does burst past players. He is creative. He links up well with Smith Rowe on the left-hand side, which is nice. But the last two big games I've seen him play, um, because I only caught bits and pieces of the Newcastle game, the last two uh, games are, are big games I've seen him play were United and Liverpool. And in both games, he made goal-conceding errors. Against Liverpool, he was playing out from a goal kick and he runs the ball into the middle of the pitch and then gives it away. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, someone from Liverpool come and take this, which was annoying. And against United, he gets caught on the ball, um, trying to play it into Smith Rowe, and then Rashford breaks on the side and squares it, and Ronaldo scores. Tierney is probably better defensively. Um, I'd say he's got, for what we've seen, has better intangibles. Um, maybe because Tommy Yasu is more like defensively stout, Arteta wants the other side to be a bit more creative and freer. And I would say maybe Tavares has. Is looking to attack more than Tierney is, even though Tierney is quite an attacking left back. Um, I'm unsure why he's keeping him out of the team. I'm not personally too fussed at it, but the issue is that when you think of Tierney, you don't think of mistakes leading to goals. Currently, with Tavares, of course, he's very young. That is what I'm thinking of. Um, so that's just one to watch out there. Thomas Partey, like I'm going to be telling you guys for weeks and weeks, Thomas Partey is Fred with better publicity because he came from a good Atletico Madrid team. And he's got bare hair, and he's a bit bigger. People think that he is good in the in the middle of the pitch. Thomas Partey, I'm on to you. Don't pass well, don't dribble well, and our team is too much of a sieve for me to trust you defensively, especially in the middle of the pitch. Playing you next to El Nene, I thought, Arteta, are you sure you want to do that? Because there's nothing really progressive going on there. I wouldn't even have been fussed if you played Smith Rowe a bit deeper and played a free man midfield, but whatever. Partey, I'm on to you. Watch it. I think him and Lukonga is not good enough. And I, I don't mind Partey and Shaka, but that's because Shaka is a very good passer. Partey himself, hmm, I'm, I'm looking at him. And Aubameyang, are you going to sort it out? We need a striker so badly, it's comical. Like, I would, if this was a stupid career mode then I was annoyed at Arsenal, I'd be like, Lautaro Martinez, I'll pay you a trillion pounds a week and you don't care transfer. Victor Osimhen, um, Dusan Flahovic, we need a nine imminently because we are so tame up front. All, all of our attacking prowess comes from Saka and Smith Rowe. Martinelli, I thought, was very good in this game, by the way. Um, but if it's not for Saka and Smith Rowe, we don't, we don't create or score anything. Aubameyang looked. It felt like we were playing with 10 men. He's really, really ineffective right now. And Lacazette is a 5 for 8 target man, so that guy just. I like him, but he gets on my nerves when I watch him play. Um, I said that we should have sold Aubameyang. Literally the day after the FA Cup final, when he whipped Chelsea, I would have sold him right then. His stock was at his highest. He just hit 30. Barcelona were a stupid club, looking to spend stupid money, and made a bid for him. I would have bitten their hand off for the money. Because you don't want to get to this point where a guy whose pace is a key part of his game is starting to lose it, and he slows down. Because then he's really ineffective. Um, I'm not too worried for Arsenal, but it's just 
it's just annoying to see how far away we are from those top teams in the league. Like, it's quite painful. Um, Cristiano Ronaldo, again, <laughs> Cristiano Ronaldo is the better version of Aubameyang because I actually thought he was quite missing in the game, but he scored twice. <laughs> Uh, obviously, it's a pen, so whatever. Like he has to score it, but it's whatever. But he does what Aubameyang doesn't do. Where even when he is old and uh, slowing down a little bit, he still like is effective in games. And since you've seen him at United, yes, it's a big deal that he doesn't press and he ruins the system of the team. And Greenwood isn't getting minutes and yada 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 yada. But when he does score, he scores big goals at big moments for that team. And as much as I think it's still an awful signing, I see why it's been effective because I'm unsure if Edison Cavani would have finished all those chances. I still don't think they should have done it. I still wouldn't sacrifice the youth of that team for a team that's currently not good enough to win the league. Like this Manchester United squad, everyone says it's very good and it is very it is very good. It's not good enough to win the league. So I wouldn't have sacrificed the development of those players for someone who's not going to renew the league. But he, he's doing what Aubameyang's not doing right now, which is scoring goals and being effective for us. So, please. Please, Arteta, sort it out. You're really stressing me out. Liverpool, Everton. Um, I didn't catch this game live. I was busy doing other stuff. Um, but I've caught up to most of the game and seen all the goals and the key moments. And Everton are terrifying right now. Not in a good way. Um... But let's always start with the good. Let's do Liverpool first. Liverpool are extremely dominant, as always. Um, so fast, so technically effective, so scary. It feels like when you're playing against them, it's like a swarm. It's like a, a big swarm of players around you. And everyone's moving so fast and doing everything so quickly. It rem- okay, backtrack and sidetrack. There was a there's a book that Pep that's about Pep I think called Pep Continental or something something similar to that, um, and he talks about the most important thing in players, and he talks about speed. So he says the important thing in football, the thing that people always think is that fast players, like physically fast players, are important players to have because they can run fast and move from one place to the other quickly. So like Jesus Navas is really really wanted because he's very fast. So as long as you have a good passer, you can overhit it and Navas will get there so your keeper's screwed. He says that's the least important type of pace. He says the most important type of pace is speed of thought, which is why Philip Lahm was one of the best players he's ever coached. I think he said he's the best player he's ever coached. Because Lahm thought about the game so quickly that he didn't have to actually be physically fast because he was already making the correct decision. So by the time everyone else caught up to him, Lam was in the right position anyway. He didn't need to run quickly. And he said the second most important type of speed is technical speed. When the ball goes into Tony Cross's feet, Tony Cross doesn't have to take two or three or four touches to then finally release the pass. He takes one touch, the touch is in the right place at every time, so you can make that pass faster. Mo Salah doesn't need to have a bunch of skills and be like very flamboyant and scary with his moves because he does everything technically very fast. So he doesn't need to beat you with six step overs, because as soon as he cuts inside, you're screwed, because he's done it so quickly. Liverpool, entire team is like that. The speed of thought and the technical speed is terrifying. They're just blowing teams off the park at the moment. In the last couple of weeks, United got battered, Arsenal got battered, Everton have got battered. I wouldn't be surprised if they went and stuck it on the rest of the league. Now, I just want to say, you know, it's before Christmas, but I called them to win the league when everybody else thought Chelsea and Manchester City would win the league. I just want to say that. But Everton, um, goodness gracious, where do you even start with them? Everton are unfortunate because they were what teams like Aston Villa and Leicester and old school Newcastle were trying to achieve where you haven't got enough money or enough clout to pull the big players from the top four. So what you have to do is like mishmash a very competent squad and try and hope to put in a good challenge for a European, like a Europa League spot. Which is what has happened at places like Villa and Leicester, where you know you can't compete for a Cristiano Ronaldo or a Bruno Fernandes, 
So what you need to do is find the, the like smaller technical players like Ian Nacho or Buendia or whatever, and mishmash the squad, a competent squad with a good manager and hope everything blends. Now Everton's problem is that they're almost too rich for their own good. Like they if you've got time and you want to laugh, go on transfer market and look at Everton's recent transfers for like the last five years, because they are a mess. A proper mess. And because they've switched from Martinez to um, Marco Silva to Ancelotti to Benitez, some of those players have hung around, but those are all four very different type of managers. So the style of play, there aren't many players. There aren't many that are useful for Carlo Ancelotti that will be useful for Rafa Benitez, especially going forward. So, Everton are in it. Oh, and even if they are using the same players, they use them in completely different ways. Like, the, Carlo Ancelotti would never have signed Salomon Rondon, for example. Even though Salomon Rondon is a very, very poor man's Dominic Carver-Lewin. Uses them in completely different ways. With Everton, I feel, I feel bad for Rafa. But also, you're meant to be, if you're known for anything, it's for being like defensively stingy. And right now, your team is a turnstile. When Watford are sticking it on you that bad, you have a big problem. He's been without his best player by far, which is fair. And his best creator in James Rodriguez has left. Even though he didn't like him and he kind of forced him out of the club. But you have no grace with these fans because you are an ex Liverpool manager. So if you're going to make your impact, it has to be ASAP. If I was him, I probably would have tried to sign two or three like big defensive talents. Seamus Coleman is on his way out. Keane, Godfrey, Mina, neither of them are really stand out. Neither of them are like next level. Um, I would have tried to get a defender probably. Maybe some cover in for Alan. I can't lie, Tom Davies, I'm not really loving him. And I would, you need to sign another lights out attacker. Like Richarlison and Calvert-Lewin are very good. But I would try and find someone of a different profile. Like, a, obviously, you can't sign him. And it's it's easy to say this. But like a Rafinha, like a winger who can dribble and beat people. Because in that Everton team, I'm unsure of who can actually beat someone 1v1. Like, Richarlison is good. I wouldn't say Richarlison is ripping people 1v1 for technique. He's doing it because he's a bit of a massive bloke and a bit of a train. They need... A bit, they just need a bit more in that attacking third. In the last game they played before Liverpool, uh, who did they play? Brentford. I caught the majority of that game. They played Rondon up front, um, Gordon, Iwobi, and there's one more man. And Iwobi was in the 10. And they were, oh, who was that winger? God, that's going to really annoy me. And I'm going to remember it after this. Gordon, it will be one and Rondon. Anyway, if you gave Everton 200 minutes to try and score in that game, they wouldn't have done it. Given them 500, they wouldn't have done it. None of those players, they never beat someone enough that you'd make pocket for the next man to run into that space or just create a little bit of chaos enough that someone like Rondon can get half a yard. They are so poor going forward and they're not tight enough defensively to fix it so a you need to sort out that attack and go goal scoring or if you're Rafa and you really you know yourself and you're kind of stuck to your your tactics and your game plan now you need to shut that defense up like make it tight back there maybe even get another man to play next to Decore if Alan's injured or his legs are a bit aging find another sit who is Mbamin that guy who has even played Find someone serious right now because Everton are a mess. Um, just a few other things that I wanted to cover. Um, the Ballon d'Or. Messi won again for a seventh shout out to him. For probably the greatest person to ever do one single thing for this long. Um, he might actually be, of all the people who are the best in the world at what they do, he might be the best of all the best. Anyway, besides that. It should have been Lewandowski's. Lewandowski got robbed. It should have been him from the year before. And you can argue it could have been him this year. The The thing that hurt Lewandowski's case is the narrative. And the narrative was that Bayern Munich are already a powerhouse team. And then they have a superstar up front. With Messi, the narrative was that the Barcelona team he was in was awful. So he literally did everything himself. That doesn't actually mean that he performed better than Lewandowski. It means that it seemed as if he did, 
because the people around him were so much worse. Lewandowski scores a trillion goals this season. He's probably been the best nine in the world for the last 10 years. Every season, it's like 40 goals. If it's not 40, it's 39. He's scoring 40 goals in league campaigns. The guy should have won it. I didn't know, because obviously the Ballon d'Or has been around for much longer than I've been alive. I didn't actually know that it was journalists who voted. For some reason, I thought it was like players player, <laughs> like the worldwide players player. And there's a few managers and coaches and some players get a vote. Um, but the majority of it is journalists. Why is that the case? Why is, why is it everyone from the outside looking in who's making a decision? And what the people on the inside know more. I would I would bet if the players voted, they would have voted for Lewandowski. Because what he did this year was phenomenal. Messi was very good, as always. Lewandowski was phenomenal. And, Levin, and they shouldn't have cancelled it the year before. And Lewandowski would have definitely won that. Um, I don't know why things like this are... Individual awards in a team sport is weird anyway. But... It's just a bit frustrating because Lewandowski deserves one. I just feel bad for him. He should have had one. Um, and I know all the Bayern Munich players are coming out right now, like Vex, and they're saying this is what happened with Ribery in 2013 and what happened with Robin. And we don't get the same respect as the rest of the, um, the rest of the top leagues do, which is understandable. But if I was Lewandowski, I'd just be really annoyed. And when they've got Barcelona, I think this week coming up, they are going to get it. You should watch out for that. Um, uh, just the last thing I wanted to speak on, I haven't actually thought any of this through, um, I've just been wondering recently, what is happening with teams coming up, doing really well in their first season, and then the second season, a bit dicey? Happened with Sheffield United, happened with Leeds, however, with Aston Villa, they came up, first season, almost relegation, and then second season, crushed it. Obviously, they had Jack Grealish, who was the best player to play in all those teams. But I just wonder, is it better to struggle in your first season and build on a platform rather than to do well in your first season and then teams take more note of you and are a bit more wary and maybe more of your players leave the club because they did more standout? Um, only because I'm wondering about Leeds right now. Like, I think I had them, like when I guessed, finishing like top eight. And I was like on the ropes for them. And I'm just wondering. And also, but Wolves, I don't know. I haven't thought it through. I haven't thought it through. I'm just thinking out loud. But anyway, thanks for this week. Um, thanks for supporting. Thanks for listening. Tell your tell your vet. Tell your local corner shop owner. Um, tell your dentist to listen to the pod. Um, follow the Instagram. Follow the pages. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'll see you guys next week. Peace.